to somebody, tell them you're glad to see them. Happy New Year. Wish them Happy New Year. In Jesus' name. Yes, yes, yes. My, my, my. I love everybody. I have a picture of when I was about three or four months old, and mom, I guess, took me. And I'm really, really, really dating myself. All the older folk in here know, remember Olin Mills? <laughs> Go get your pictures taken at Olin Mills. Well, I'm propped up with a little, little, little baby shirt on that says, I love everybody. And when my late wife saw that for the first time, she said, oh, my gosh, that is so Michael Smith right there. I, I love everybody. And I've, all my whole life, from the time we were first married, raising both of our children, every time I'd walk out the door, I'd say, I love everybody. It's just become a habit. And um, how many of you know folk need to hear that? Come on. People need to hear. People need to hear that. Their love, they need to hear that God loves them. And the only thing is, we need to make sure that our message and our actions don't contradict each other. You know, it doesn't make any sense when you're telling people God loves them and you, you can't stand them yourself. Come on, somebody. Now, you know, uh, it, I, I understand, I know what it means uh, to, to be in relationship and go through difficult times. And there are those times when you just just sure that God cursed you when he gave you those teenagers. I remember those years. You're just gritting your teeth and biting your tongue being parental. And uh, yeah, you love them, but you sure as heck don't like them sometimes. Um, I'm just thankful that God never gives up on me and I can come back again and again and again. Everybody say again. Welcome this morning. Happy New Year 2023. My goodness, all the prophecy teachers thought we'd be gone 40 years before now, and we're still here. That means we've still got a job to do. The church is to be the church. It's to be the light in the middle of darkness. It's to be the beacon of hope in the middle of despair, in the middle of all of the discouragement and disheartening news that we face locally, nationally, globally, with all the junk that's going on and all of the, the destruction and the violence and the crime in the middle of that, God help us to shine his light in the middle of a wicked and perverse generation, Philippians chapter 2 says. Come on, somebody, put your hands together and give the Lord praise. I'm glad to be alive. I'm glad to know Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord of my life. I'm glad that I know you. I'm glad that we live in this area. I, I believe that the blessing of the Lord is the upright, is on the city. It's exalted when the people bless the community that they live in. Don't let words of cursing and negativity come out of your mouth. Every place that you live in has problems. I don't care how wonderful it is. The grass is greener over there because they're watering it and fertilizing it. Come on, somebody. And so we want to begin this year with a new series called Pursue. To Pursue. I remember 1 Samuel chapter 30 when <clears throat> the enemy army had come in and robbed and kidnapped all the wives of David and his mighty men and their children had been kidnapped and their tents had been robbed and all of their earthly goods, their material possessions were all gone and there was so much discouragement in the camp that some of the men who greatly loved David actually began to whisper about stoning him. Can you imagine being a leader and you hear folk talking about plotting against your life? in some kind of an assassination attempt. And 
when there was nobody else around to encourage David. I love this passage of Scripture because it said David encouraged himself in the Lord. And how many of you know when there's nobody else to encourage you, sometimes you just have to make up your mind that you're going to get up and be your own cheerleader. You just have to begin to refocus on the blessings of God that are in your life and not on the circumstances and where you've just been robbed or been mugged or had a car accident or gotten bad medical news or the relationship is on the rocks or any number of things that can face us in this time. David encouraged himself in the Lord. And I, I believe that when you do that, you first of all get your mind off what everybody else is saying and you get your mind off of your problems and you lift up your perspective and begin to look. Uh, he said, I will look to the hills from whence come, cometh my help. It comes from the Lord, great God Almighty, He never fails. Everybody say, look up. And as you begin to look up and begin to give God praise, it's amazing how perspectives start to change and you get a different outlook and you get a different in-look and all of a sudden the Spirit of the Lord comes and encouragement begins to rise. And so this morning I want to encourage you some because the Word of the Lord came to David in that moment and he said, pursue. Everybody say, pursue. David said, God, should we go after these enemy armies? Should we go and, 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 and get back what is ours? Should we go and take back our wives who've been kidnapped and our children who have, have been ripped from our tents and all of our earthly goods? And the word of the Lord said, per, pursue, overtake, you will recover all. Everybody say, pursue, overtake, you will recover all. And the Lord gave this word to me for this year. He said, pursue. And it came from 1 Samuel chapter 30. Some of us have gone through some difficult seasons. As a matter of fact, I think every one of us on the planet in the last two years recovering from a pandemic and a, and a demanded shutdown in our economy and inflationary rates that are higher than they've been in 40 years. And, and every time you turn around, somebody's sick and hacking and and do, do you wear a mask or don't wear a mask? And then that becomes a fight. And then do I vaccinate or not vaccinate? And that becomes a fight. And everything is just all constantly just tearing up your peace and robbing your joy. How many of you are thankful in the middle of that? God is the anchor in the middle of the storm. Everybody say pursue. So this morning we're going to talk about prayer that pursues. Pastor Haley will be ministering next Sunday. I'll come in the third one, Pastor Jeremy the fourth one. We didn't receive communion this morning because we're going to have a very special service the 29th, the fifth Sunday of January in a DNA moment where we talk about what communion literally means. We're going to teach on it. We're going to give you a historical perspective, what happened in the Old Testament, how the New Covenant fulfills that old, some practical principles concerning communion, the Lord's table, the, the, the Lord's supper, the covenant meal, the Eucharist, whatever your particular Christian heritage is, or maybe if you're not church, that's fine, then you're coming in with a fresh understanding and a neutral perspective on this. So we want to just give you what our understanding here at Victory is. And you know, too often folk want to take a really extreme narrow view of a particular teaching or a doctrine. And and, and I really do believe that there is there is a there is a a, a, a kind of a uh, there's some fences in terms of principles in the scripture, but within those fences, there's some, there's some room, there's some liberty, there's some freedom. And just like when you go down the street and the family down the street from you does not do the same mealtime traditions, some folk bow their heads and pray, and other folk are sitting around the counter and, and they're doing things differently. And I always taught my children, respect the places that you go and visit because they do things differently than we do. doesn't mean that they're wrong and we're right. It just means that they're different. And so I have labored for years to build an appreciation for the larger body of Christ that celebrates the same concepts, but they do them differently than we do. Come on, somebody. Are you hearing me this morning? And how many of you know their home is in heaven just like yours is? And Jesus is Savior and Lord of their life, just like he is yours. Come on, somebody, say amen. And too often, we major on the minors and minor on the majors, and it was from the Reformation that this statement came. It was in the essentials, unity. 
Essentials are issues that are salvific. They make a difference in your salvation. We're talking about things like the virgin birth, the blood of Jesus Christ as the sacrifice that paid the penalty for your sins and for death and for the curse. There, there's just a very small number of essentials. Then there's a whole huge body of different ideas that are called non-essentials. And, and the statement from the Reformation said it this way, in the essentials, unity. In the non-essentials, liberty. Okay? You, you know what? We, we lay hands on folk to be healed here at Victory. There are other churches don't do that. But that doesn't mean that, 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 that they're not going to heaven. That just means that we have embraced something that we see in the Word, and there's liberty in that. What you believe about the end time, whether you're pre or, or mid or post-trib or no-trib or, or, or any of these different views about the end of the world or the end times, uh, those things don't make a difference in your salvation. And so we don't draw a line in the sand and tell everybody that doesn't agree with us that they're going to hell. Are you following me? Okay, so that Sunday we're going to be talking about communion. Uh, a couple of little announcements I want to get out of the way because we're driving something here that's so critical. We're starting a new Bible study here at Victory that's going to go year-round, but we're doing it in a new, fresh way. We're only going to do a subject for six weeks. I'm starting it January the 10th on a Tuesday night at 6.30, and I believe we've already had over 50 people sign up, so we'll probably end up having to be here in the sanctuary. We're talking 90 minutes max. We're talking a teaching time, divide up into some groups, have some prayer, some, we'll do some discussion, and then divide up in groups and have some prayer. And so we're excited about that. Whatever we do, it'll be six weeks, take two off. Everybody say six weeks, take two off, and then you'll, then you'll have a chance to sign up for something different. I think the next one is what, Philippians? Is that right? Okay. So then we'll go six weeks, take two off. Then there'll be another book of the Bible that'll be available, and we're tapping folk in the congregation in order to make some room for their gifting to lead the, I'm doing the first one, but I'm not doing all of them. I don't want to do all of them. Come on, somebody. But there are plenty of folk here, and we're excited about that, and so we'll do this six weeks, take a couple of weeks break, and the reason we're doing it that way is because it's not like your typical Wednesday night service that is perpetual, that you feel like you've, it's, it's obligatory. If you don't go, then somebody's going to judge you. And, you know, you, 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 sometimes you just feel like, I can't commit to this for the rest of my life. But you can commit to six weeks. Come on, somebody. And then the next one, if you need a break, that's great. But there will be something else available. And these will also run during uh, cell groups or life groups. When we do them, it will be a life group in itself. But this way, we've got a constant Bible study going on. So we're beginning to develop and build into the people of God, and building disciples Building your worldview based upon God's Word. Everybody say God's Word. And so I'm excited about that. I want to jump in this message this morning quickly. Prayer that pursues. Say that with me. Prayer that pursues. I have a text found in the book of Jeremiah, chapter 29, verses 10 through 14. This is a familiar passage. This is one that has just about in the last 20 years become cliche in American Christianity. It's printed as a scripture in the graduation cards when you graduate high school or college or have a major accomplishment or something like that. And it is, I, I believe, it has given us the idea uh, that basically God is not ever going to let anything difficult or hard come your way. And it sort of creates a kind of bed of roses, American Christianity. And that if you really are walking with God, you won't ever have any trouble. How many of you know that ain't right? So let's get the context of Jeremiah 29. This is what the Lord says. You will be in Babylon for 70 years. But then I will come and do for you all the good things I have promised. And I will bring you home again. Now, look where the verse is. It's in this setting. It's a diamond in this goal setting of you're going to walk through some tough times, but know when you're in the middle of it. Here it comes. I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. They are plans for good and not for disaster, to give you a future and a hope. Now, when you take that verse and it, you extricate it and pull it out of its context 
you can make it say anything you want to, but when you put it in the context, it carries the weight and the substance of what God is saying, not just specifically to the people that were captives in Babylon in that moment, but whatever you're going through in a season of difficulty, know that God is going to not necessarily snatch you out of it, but He's going to get down in the middle of it and walk through it with you. And He says, I'm going to show you and show out and reveal that my plans for you are for your good and for a future and a hope. Notice that it says in verse 12, In those days when you pray, everybody say, when you pray, He says, I will listen. Now, how many of you are glad to know that when you open your mouth to pray, and that's literally the, the, the tool that God has given us, prayer is our means of communicating to God our wants, our desires, our needs, our dreams, our struggles, our fears, our doubts, our difficulties, our praise, our thanksgiving. Prayer is given to us by God as a means for us to speak it out, for us to say it. For us to get the struggle, the, 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 the burden off of our chest. Scott sang it this morning and he said, I, I'm carrying a burden that I'm, I'm not meant to carry alone. And prayer is the means by which we're able to unload the unnecessary weight. Cast your care upon him for he cares for you, First Peter says. In those days when you pray, I will listen. If you look for me wholeheartedly, everybody say whole heart, you will find me. I love that. I will be found by you, says the Lord. I will end your captivity and restore your fortunes. I will gather you out of the nations where I sent you, and I will bring you home again to your own land. One thing, one thing. Repeat this through the message because it's a summary of what I'm trying to bring to you. It's like a diamond in a jewelry store. It's always set on black velvet and the lights are bright, and the jeweler will take that diamond and turn it around so that you can see the prism of light coming through it and all of the facets, the beautiful clarity and the cut and, and the color. And God has designed that the church would be like a diamond sitting on the blackness, the, 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 the darkness of a wicked culture so that we would shine like a light. And he says, this is our one thing, when we set our hearts to seek God, he promises that he will hear us and we will find him. So in the beginning of 2022, I want you to say this this morning like you mean it. Come on. When we set our hearts to seek God, he promises that he will hear us and we will find him. Come on, this side, help me. When we set our hearts to seek God, he promises that he will hear us and we will find him. Everybody in the room, one more time. When we set our hearts to seek God, he promises that he will hear us and we will find him. One of my favorite verses of scripture I memorized in college. I used to leave my dorm room with a 3 by 5 card, index card, with the scripture printed on it. And by the end of the day, I would have muttered that, meditated it, stated it, said it somewhere where I wasn't in the presence of people because I didn't want to be a weirdo. But in between classes, I may just be looking at it, standing in the hall, waiting for a class to dismiss and one to go in. And I memorized so many scriptures in those four years Sometimes not just a verse or two, sometimes five or six verses, and I would memorize whole chapters and whole books of the Bible. I remember when I set out to memorize the book of Ephesians, and just, I'm so grateful that I took that time, and I still memorize scripture, and this is one of my favorites. From the King James, it says, the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous, and his ears are open to their prayers, but the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. Now, you choose where you live in that scripture. Somebody says, well, no, there are none righteous, no, not one. Yes, but now in Christ, you are the righteousness of God in him. Come on, somebody. And when it talks about the just or the righteous, that's you, okay? You've got to re-identify. You've got to renew your thinking about who you are now in Christ. The, the NLT, New Living Translation, says, The eyes of the Lord watch over those who do right, and his ears are open to their prayers, but the Lord turns his face against those who do evil. And this morning, three things real quickly, just two, two real quick principles I want to grab, and then I'm going to give you five principles of prevailing prayer. Okay, are you ready? Here we go. Number one, everybody say hide and seek. 
How many of you played hide and seek when you were a kid? And, uh, you know, you remember uh, when the babies, um, you know, starting to learn uh, that, you know, you, you pull the cover off the head and the baby giggles and it's the coolest thing and you go, pee pie, where's Mikey, you know, or whatever the baby's name is. And, and, and then as the child learns to, you know, run around and hide behind a curtain, you can see their feet sticking out underneath and they're hiding and you're playing and you're looking for them, you know, right where they are. But it's fun because they're being pursued. And I don't want you to think of this as a juvenile game, but the heart of our Father loves to be pursued by us. The book of Song of Solomon says, draw me after you and let us run together. So when I cry out to God, the scripture says that if I will just take a step to draw near to God, he says if you will draw near to God, he will draw near to you. Come on, somebody. And, and you know what? If you, if you never take that step, then he can be Bette Midler's God at a distance. And, and, and I'm not interested in a God that's out there far away. As a matter of fact, the old covenant God was this transcendent God that was unreachable. He was, they prayed for 4,000 years in the name of somebody else's God. They prayed in the name of their father Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But when Jesus came, he said, no longer do that. He was literally standing against tradition. He says, when you pray, say, our Father. We sang it this morning. Our Father. Notice it's not just my Father, because you're not in this alone by yourself. But it's our Father. You know, when you get Jesus, if, if somebody said, you know, if it's just me and Jesus, that's fine. Yeah, but you get that whole troop with him that comes. And that's where the trouble starts. It's all those other disciples. That's where we have to learn how to get along and walk in forgiveness and exercise patience and forbearance and long-suffering and gentleness and kindness and all of those fruit of the Spirit that we don't want to hear anything about. How many of you know what I'm talking about? Hide and seek. God loves to hide in the circumstances of our lives so that we have to intentionally put on eyes of faith and look to see where his hand is working. I was sitting with Drew and Abby this last week and with Holly, my stepdaughter, not stepdaughter, my, my daughter-in-law, have mercy, and my two grandsons, Henry and Grady, and we were in a restaurant together and just Abby was telling a story about just how overwhelmed and amazed that she is that God has moved through some circumstances in her life. And Drew told a story about a, a deal that he was working on and how somebody that he got there actually knew him and had already put a word in for him. And, and the guy was just excited to meet him and gave him all this business. And, and, and I just sat here and I, I said, you know what, that's the invisible hand of the Lord that is moving behind the scenes working all things together for our good because we love him and we are the called according to his purpose. And I just sat there and rejoiced hearing my children give a testimony about how they know that it's hard as they've worked, that it's the hand of God moving and working, bringing circumstances about in their lives. It's amazing how when we stop and look and we go, no, no, this is not just a coincidence. It's first of all, as a Christian, we don't believe in coincidence. We believe in providence. We believe that God's hand provides for us. Somebody say amen. amen. Proverbs 25, 2 is a verse of Scripture that's always fascinated me. I memorized this one in college, too. It says, it's the glory of God to conceal a thing. To conceal something is to hide it. Yeah, you ladies know about concealer, you know. And maybe some of you guys do too. I, I, I'm not too good to tell you. I remember I had a pimple one time and Dawn said, here, take some of this concealer. And I said, well, yeah, that looked like I got a big, big old beige spot on my face. She said, no, come in here. I'll do, you, do it for you. And I said, hey, that, that stuff works pretty good. Concealer. It's the glory of God to conceal a thing. And the, the scripture says, it's the honor of kings to search out a matter. God has invested in this universe, in this amazing world. I, I, I truly believe that everything that is on the planet has a purpose. I, I, I believe that every herb and every tree and every seed and every animal, that if we will keep asking questions and searching out matters, that God will give us secrets that will cure cancer and that will heal disease and, 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 and that will set people on the right path in their thinking. Hallelujah. Uh, you don't realize it, but when Adam and Eve were walking around in that garden, there were cell phones hanging in those trees. They just couldn't see them yet. 
There was technology there. See, in the middle of the garden that God's put you down in, everything you need is already there and provided. But look at your neighbor and say, shake a tree. you got to shake some fruit out of the tree because God glories in concealing things, but it's the honor of kings. And guess what? In Christ, we are kings and priests. It's the honor of kings to search out a matter. The NLT says it this way. It's, God, it's God's privilege to conceal things and the king's privilege to discover them. We have grown up in this generation thinking that religion and science have always been contrary to one another. And really, science was the product of minds devoted to God who loved the Lord with all of your, their mind. And they begin to ask questions about the creator and his creation. And the scientific method from Francis Bacon actually began with a holy pursuit of knowledge that God has revealed in the known world. And then at some point, things begin to separate. The mother religion and the daughter science have had a rift for the last about 200 years. And I want you to know that there is nothing wrong with pursuing questions, with asking God, with not quitting until you've got an answer. Come on, somebody. And, and God glories in hiding things, concealing things, but it's our honor to pursue it and search out a matter. Somebody say amen. Point number two, abiding in the vine of relationship. I don't have time to dig into John 15. It's the famous passage where Jesus said, I am the vine, you are the branches, my father has planted this vine, he basically says, and he says, if you don't bear fruit, your branches are pruned and thrown into the fire. If you bear fruit, you're pruned so that you may bring forth more fruit. Now, in case you missed it, look at your neighbor and say, you're pruned if you do, and you're pruned if you don't. You're pruned if you do, and you're pruned if you don't. Guess what? You walk with God, there's going to be some pruning. Every person who's ever raised a fruit tree knows that you have to prune branches in order. You have to pop those little tendrils out of the tomato plant so that you don't have those suckers sucking the life out of the whole plant and you get the bigger pieces of fruit. So when we're going through the, the, the difficult time of feeling the pruning hand of God moving something out of our lives, it's because God sees potential in me and you, and he's preparing us for something that's greater in our future that is not yet ready for us or we are not re yet ready for it. So pruning is a good thing. It's not a comfortable thing. But he says, he goes on to say in verse 7, but if you remain in me, King James says, if you abide in me, if you remain in me and my words remain in you, you may ask for anything you want and it will be granted. Oh, that can't be possible. Pastor, I just don't. What do you mean anything you want? That's what he said. Well, first of all, if you're really abiding in the vine, you're going to ask something according to his will because you're connected to the vine. It's not something crazy. This is not some ridiculous notion that you come up with, but he says anything you want. Well, guess what? Because you're in the vine, what is it, Psalm 37, about verse 4, says delight in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. Now, prosperity preachers, and I, I am one, I'm not, a, I'm not a health and wealth guy, I believe in biblical prosperity. Uh, I, that's not my whole focus uh, but I, I just want to tell you that people who want to curse on that all the time, uh, you, not, you, you never have really been bad poor enough long enough to realize that God wants to bless you. He wants to put, he wants to put a blessing on what you put your hand to. Now, that can't be our whole focus because the gospel is much, much bigger than just our finances. But the gospel is big enough to cover your finances too. Come on, somebody. Are you hearing me this morning? And he says, you may ask anything you want. Years ago, I heard this, and it was a, one of those prosperity preachers who said, if you just delight in God, then he'll give you whatever your heart's desire is. And as I matured in the Lord later, I began to realize that, yes, maybe as an immature Christian, how many of you, know, how many of you remember when you first got saved, every prayer you prayed got answered? Remember that? Remember how you prayed for stuff and it just shocked you? Anybody in the room, do you remember? Maybe it's been too long ago for some of us. But you just, you, you prayed, and like, man, God showed up, and, he, and, and needs were met, and prayers got answered. Well, guess what? When a baby is born into a family, guess what happens? Every time that baby cries, what does mom and daddy do? 
They meet the need of that baby. But guess what? When that baby starts growing up and that baby is walking on his own and he or she is taking a little fork and, you know, a little plastic softened edge fork and starts feeding himself, herself. How many of you know that every time you scream doesn't necessarily mean what you want is going to be given to you because you're maturing, you're growing up. And it's amazing how over the years I had to teach my son who loves sweet tea. He's a true southern gentleman. And he would go to the refrigerator, and it was amazing how he would open the door, and there was already prepared a full gallon of sweet tea made right. And how many of you know there's a, there's a right way to make sweet tea? Now, that's another message. And he would, you know, for a time he would want it, and, and, and Mama would pour it for him, and she would say, no, you, you, you big boy, you can go get you some ice and get you a glass and pour your own tea. We know there came a time when we started saying, Drew, guess what? This is how the tea doesn't just magically appear in the refrigerator. This is how you make the gallon of tea. So let me teach you. Oh, no, I don't want to know how to do that. <laughs> See, how, sometimes we just want to pray and God zip open the windows of heaven and dump down the blessing. He, and Moses and Joshua both prepared the children of Israel to go into the land of Israel. And he said, you know what? You're going to get over there in that land of milk and honey. And he said, there's copper in those hills. And well, wait a minute. It's in the hills. You mean we're going to have to mine it out of there? We're going to have to get on our, we're going to have to work? We've had manna for 40 years dropping on the lawn every day. We've had, we've had McManna to go every morning. And, and, and all of a sudden, they get over there in the promised land, and they're maturing, and they're growing, and the manna's not dropping down out of the sky every morning and appearing on the lawn, but they've got to go over there and take some seed and dig a hole in the ground and plant it and eat some mature corn from the land that they've grown. Come on, somebody. God will feed the birds, but he doesn't just throw the worm in the nest. Are you hearing me this morning? So what, what I'm telling you is, is that when he says, if you ask anything you want, delight in the Lord, he'll give you the desires of your heart. I believe that literally means when I am connected to him, he starts to reorder giving me the right kind of desires that he wants me to have in my heart. Then I ask according to his will. One thing, when we set our hearts to seek God, he promises that he will hear us and we will find him. All right, I want to give the third point and I'm finished real quickly. I've got a hand that I want you to see. And this is, this is basic. This is first of the year stuff. This is, this is, I want to say, God, I want you to find me this year with more prayer than I've had in my past. I want you, oh God, to do a thing in my life. Matter of fact, let me stop and read this. This is so good. Glenda shared this this morning. It's from an Assembly of God pastor friend of theirs, hers and Kenneth's. There was his Facebook post that he posted at midnight last night, and she saw it this morning. Happy New Year. Starting 2023 in church, I hope you are as well. I have an unusual excitement about 2023. Am I prophesying 2023 will be a wonderful year? Not at all. Neither am I declaring a year of woe. I have no idea what the year may bring, but I serve God who holds 2023 in his hands. Feast or famine, God is God. Life or death, God is God. Can you tell this guy's a preacher? Joy or mourning, God is God. May this year find me loving God more than ever. May this year find me declaring truth more than ever. May this year find me loving people more than ever. If you believe that, say amen. May this year find me more faithful than ever. May this year find me more prayerful than ever. May this year find me in the word more than ever. May this year find me ever decreasing and Jesus increasing in all my thoughts, motives, and actions. Oh, that I could reach the place of obscurity where only the invisible God is seen shining through me. I am pumped up about 2023. This is not one day of the coming year. There is not one day of the coming year that God will not be God. Say that with me. There is not one day of the coming year that God will not be God. He says, praying for you, praying for the remnant people of God. So this morning, and my last few minutes are just going to be spent with the hand, and there are hundreds of ways. I, I believe that this is important because I believe there are people in this room 
who want to take the step of developing a prayer life. The Bible says in 1 Thessalonians, pray without ceasing. That doesn't mean on your knees 24-7. Nobody can do that. But it means that I can maintain an attitude of prayer. It means that throughout the day, I can whisper little one-sentence prayers, never even have to say them out loud if I'm in an office space. But God, give me wisdom. That's a prayer right there. God, let my light shine. Lord, help me to be compassionate. I mean, can, you, can, you, can you imagine the multitudes, thousands of just one-sentence little prayers that you can pray just to keep your heart and your affection, your desires, your intentions focused on the Lord? So we've got this little picture of your hand and uh, five, five things that I want to encourage you to pray about this year. And you can easily remember this. When you look at your hand, your thumb is the closest to your heart. So as you look at one of these diagrams, it says, and let me grab my little pointer right here, it says that your thumb is the closest to your heart. So pray for those closest to you, your family and your friends, okay? So when you take a moment, just a few moments to begin to address the Lord and pray, this is a good way that you, somebody says, well, I don't know what to pray for or how to pray. Well, start right there. Father, and, and, and call, I, I call my children's names every day. I call my two grandsons. God, cover and guide and guard and protect Henry. Let the hand of the Lord be upon him. Keep him from evil in Jesus' name. Let him walk with you all the days of his life. I'm prophesying over Henry. God, thank you for Grady. Thank you for a man of valor. Raise him up. And see what I'm doing? And, 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 and I'm, I'm, I'm sitting at my desk, and I've got my coffee, and, and I'm reading the word, and I'm declaring, Lord, bless Drew as he meets with these business people, oh God, Lord, ignite inspiration in Abby's heart to write songs that will touch people and change their lives. Oh God, I pray for this church. I pray for victory. I thank you for the leadership in the house. And, and as I'm just calling, and I start, your faces start coming up before me and I go, that Lord, thank you for Randy and for Liz and bless and prosper and heal. And, and I start to call you John and Margot in the name of Jesus and Haley and Brennan, oh God. And, and, and I see faces and I start just speaking the blessing of God. And so start with your family and your friends, and then move to the pointer finger. And the pointer finger is used to give directions. Pray for teachers, coaches, therapists, doctors, first responders, people that are pointing the way in our community. God, be with our policemen and our firemen and our EMTs. And, and God, David, oh Lord, just be with David Smith and Carla, oh Lord, when he's out all night and, and, and dealing with difficult circumstances. And so I start to Think about people that I know that are in that profession. And, and, and as you move out of that, uh, notice that the middle finger is dealing with the government. Now, that's all I'll, I'll say right there. All right, you can do with that whatever you want to. Um, <laughs> the middle finger is the tallest. Pray for leaders in government, business, and the church. God, I don't care whether you voted for him or not. God, cover our president. Please, Jesus, give him wisdom. Our senators, our congressmen and women, God, our Supreme Court, Lord, our governor, our new governor elect, be with Sarah Huckabee, God, in the name of Sarah Huckabee Sanders, in Jesus' name. Lord, our mayor, Marco, our, our, our new mayor, Brick, what's her first name? Great, Tracy, yeah, I'm excited. Amazing young woman, and just to, to lead Mary, and it's wonderful. There are great opportunities that are before us. Pray for these people. My goodness, what would God do if the church would just do what he told us to do and pray for those in authority? Benjamin Franklin said, any idiot can criticize, and most idiots do. What if we would make sure that we spent as at least equaled it out, at least as much time praying for the blessing and the wisdom of God on our leaders as we criticize them. Leave that alone right there. All right, number four, the ring finger. The ring finger is the weakest finger, and I know this as a pianist. You have to really work hard to develop the musculature in the fourth finger because the tendon's tied to the middle one. <clears throat> and in order to be able to get uh, flexibility and dexterity, it's just the weakest finger on the hand. Now, I, I remember going with Dawn one time, and we were in a Macy's, and she was at the Estee Lauder, Lauder counter. And I thought it was interesting that the lady said, when you apply this stuff under your eye, Dawn, 
use your fourth finger because it's the weakest one and it won't, you know, put too much pressure on this soft skin of your eye. And I thought, knowing what I know about this prayer diagram, I thought that's pretty cool that folk recognize the weakness that's in that finger, okay? And so you pray, pray for the weak, pray for the poor, pray for the sick, pray for those that are in any kind of need. And then finally, the little pinky, what's left, after you've prayed through those four areas, then you bring your needs and your desires and your wants to God. Now, somebody says, I can't pray a long time. You know what? If you just take one minute per each of those fingers, you've already been actively pursuing the presence of God in your life for five minutes. And it's amazing how when you will take a little time to just be quiet and not give heavenly Santa Claus a Christmas list, but realize you're talking to your heavenly Father, and if you'll hush, he'll, he'll put an impression in your spirit. He'll cause the word to make a principle jump off the page at you. And he'll speak to you through your thoughts. Not, a, not an audible voice, but he'll speak to you. Maybe a, a, the words of a song will all of a sudden begin to ring. And just faith rises in your heart because you know that you've heard a word from the Lord. It's amazing how God will use circumstances if we'll just begin to set our hearts to pray. What was our one thing, did we say? We said when we set our hearts to seek God, He promises that He will hear us and we will find Him. Somebody say amen. Amen. Quickly, five things. Five. Number one, ask. Everybody say ask. We have not because we ask not. Ask is an acronym of intensity. Ask, seek, knock. A-S-K. Those are intensifying degrees of pursuit. You ask God. He, he says, yes, seek after it. And so you begin to seek the Lord. You're out. You've you got a flashlight at night, or you're seeking to find something. You're looking for hidden treasure. Kids are hiding in the house. You're seeking them. You're on your face, seeking the face of God. And then as you seek, you find a door, and you start knocking on the door. See, it's a progression of intensity. God, I ask you to reveal your plan. Okay, Lord, I seek your face. Okay, there's a door. God, I'm knocking on the door. The scripture says, he that asks receives, he that seeks finds, and to him that knocks, the door will be open. Number two, ask in faith. Everybody say in faith. Bible says in Mark chapter 11, have faith in God, I tell you the truth. You can say to this mountain, May you be lifted up and thrown into the sea, and it will happen. But you must really believe that it will happen and have no doubt in your heart. I tell you, you can pray for anything. Everybody say anything. You can pray for anything, and if you believe that you've received it, past tense, it will be yours, future tense. So, whatsoever things you desire, King James. Believe that you have them, whatsoever things you desire. When you pray, believe that you have received them, and you will have them in Jesus' name. All right, so ask, ask in faith. Point number three, forgive. Some of your prayers are not being answered in 2022 because you're carrying grudges, because you got resentment and you've got bitterness in your heart. I have no rocks. I don't have a bag of stones. I truly have nobody in mind when I'm saying this. I just know in a crowd this size, there are people that still have undealt with grudges and resentment, and it's hindering you more than it is the person that you've got a, a rock in your craw about. Get rid of the gravel. Empty your gizzard. Come on. Get rid of it. Stop that irritation. Let it go. As Elsa said on Frozen, let it go. Let it go. You know what? That doesn't mean that you've just let them off scot-free, but it means you quit carrying it and you say, God, I put this in your hands. I choose to forgive. All right? He says, when, you're, when you stand praying, forgive. Everybody say forgive. Number four, don't give up. Number four, don't give up. First is ask, two is ask in faith, three is forgive. Number four is don't give up. The Bible says, let's not get tired of doing what is good at just the right time. Everybody say the right time. At just the right time, we will reap a harvest of blessing if we don't give up. A critical principle in my life that I've learned from three generations in front of me are trust God, work hard, never quit. Say it like you mean it. Trust God, work hard, never quit. Do not give up. Too many times folk are just about to hit a breakthrough 
and they quit too soon. And somebody else comes along and presses just a little bit farther and they see the blessing of God come because somebody else didn't persist. They didn't, they didn't say, God, I'm not going to quit. I am not going to give up. At just the right time, we will reap a harvest of blessing if we don't give up. Number five, and I'm finished. Have you got anything out of this this morning? Number five, this is the acronym. Everybody say push. Pray until something happens. Say it with me. Pray until something happens. I promise you, if you will take this little hand diagram and you will begin to say, God, I want to be a man, a woman of prayer in 2023. Pray for those closest to you. Pray for those in direction in your life. Pray for the leaders of the community, the government, the church. Pray for the weak, the poor, the sick, those in need. Pray for your needs, the things that you are dealing with, the desires, the wants, your goals, your dreams. And you will do it with these five things. Ask, ask in faith, forgive. I remember somebody, I, it was Abby here a couple of trips back when she was here and she made mention of some circumstances that happened years ago in our church and just some hurt that, that happened to me, that happens to anybody who's a leader. And I just said, you know what, honey? My arms are too full of blessings to have room to carry a grudge. Can't do it. Can't do it. I refuse. I refuse to dodge somebody at Walmart because I'm, and you know what? If you've seen somebody and you've ducked around in produce trying to hunker down because you don't want to run into somebody, you know, guess what? That's the Holy Ghost telling you, get, get that right in your heart so you can meet them and put a smile on your face and even embrace them and love them and bless them. I said, baby, my arms are too full of the blessings of God to, to have room to carry a grudge. And so this morning, ask, ask in faith, forgive, don't give up. And finally, this morning, we're finished. Musicians, would you please come back as we prepare to worship the Lord in the close of this service this morning? Push. Everybody say push. Pray until something happens. Say it with me one more time. Pray until something happens. When we set our hearts to seek God, he promises that he will hear us and that we will find him. I believe that with all of my heart. Would you bow your hearts and your minds and your heads and your eyes with me, please, this morning as we go before the Lord. Heavenly Father, we thank you for a new year. Thank you for 2023. Thank you that you've given us a word to pursue, to seek your face. Lord, to cry out to you. Help us, O oh God, to make the commitment to to seek and find the things that you've hidden, the blessings, the glory of God to be revealed. Lord, thank you for wisdom and for guidance. Thank you for blessing. Thank you for new ideas. Lord, thank you for promises that we've just let sit idle, that we choose right now, oh God, to begin to lift up and put our trust in you. Lord, I thank you that there are people under the sound of my voice in this room Lord, who need that encouragement to know God in, in a new season, in a fresh season, that if they'll seek your face, that you will hear them and you will be found by them. God, we thank you for that. If there's anyone in this room who has never crossed the line of faith and said, Jesus, be my Father, be my Savior, be my Lord, that's available to you this morning, right now. That's the good news of the gospel that Jesus Christ has come and made the way. He is the way, the truth, the life. There's nothing you do to earn or work for it or deserve it, but you merely reach out by faith and take the gift of eternal life as he offers it to you. Heads bowed, eyes closed, nobody looking around. If that's you and you would say, Pastor, pray for me, would you slip up your hand? Anybody in the room? Yes. Yes. Father, in Jesus' name, I thank you, Lord, for these in this room today as we set our hearts to seek your face in this place. I ask you, Lord, that as we look to you, that you will make yourself known. Holy Spirit of God, do what only you can do. Lord, I, I just challenge those, everyone in this room, whether you've never met Jesus or you've been walking with him for 50 years, I want you to say this right now. Father, reveal yourself to me. Show up in my life. 
I lean into you, not my own understanding. I turn from my past. I turn to you in faith. Be Lord of my life. In Jesus' name I pray. And all of God's people said, put your hands together and give the Lord praise.